<laughs> Frieza, consider this our resignation. Hey guys, Toshio Ra here with another Dragon Ball What If, and this time I'm going completely out of the box here with What If Bardock Stopped Frieza? Now, let's not mistake this for Masako X's What If Bardock Convinced the Saiyans. Oh no, no, no. This is What If Bardock Stopped Frieza? As in, stopped him from destroying planet Vegeta. But, how's he gonna do that? Bardock's a weakling compared to Frieza. How's he supposed to do that? Well, stick around and we'll find out. Now, in order for this what if to work, we are gonna be combining the events of what happens in Dragon Ball Super Broly and the Bardock TV special, Bardock the Father of Goku. Because it's the only way this scenario is actually going to work, and I think we'll get a more interesting and better story out of it in the long run. Anyway, let's get into it. Our story begins on the red planet of Planet Vegeta. And King Vegeta has just received a nasty surprise. For he has just been informed that... King Cold is officially retiring and handing off his his mantle to his son, the now Lord Frieza. <laughs> Hello, monkeys! <laughs> and of course, we know how that went down, don't we? But of course, King Vegeta gets another nasty surprise. A young Saiyan by the name of Broly, who is, of course, a lot stronger than his own son, Prince Vegeta. And that goes exactly like it does in the anime, with Broly getting banished and his father, Colonel Paragus, chasing after him. They end up on planet Vampa. But now we get to where things start to change. We are now on the planet Kanasa. And Bardock and his entire team are doing their job and smashing it out just like they do in the Bardock TV special. You see, this is where the um, two different timelines join together in this, for the sake of this what if. And this, of course, and this of course ends with Bardock and his team completely wiping out the Kanasan race, exactly how it goes in the anime complete with the com later on they're celebrating having their little talk about Goku's newborn little Kakarot and um, of course the commander who can see the future has his little one last stand with Bardock and gives him the power of foresight so Bardock could live the horror of his end and the end of his entire civilization at least that was the plan. And again, and here's where we sort of collide with the other timeline again. Because while Bardock is knocked out and sleeped, thanks to the transference of power from the dead um, Canassian to, to Bardock, in order for him to have the power of foresight, and while Bardock is under, the other Saiyans receive a call to return home immediately just like in Dragon Ball Super Broly. Now, and of course, they get on the ship, they're heading home. Now, what this does, when we think of the father of Goku timeline, this means Goku's entire team gets to live, lo gets to live longer. There's no fight with them and Dodoria because Frieza's just going to wipe out the planet. There's no need for them to destroy Bardock and his team when he's just going to wipe them all out anyway. And besides, I don't think anyone really liked that fight anyway. Bardock losing to Dodoria? Come on. <laughs> so, we get to um, skip over that. We get to, uh, uh, actually, no, not skip over that, avoid that altogether. So Bardock and his entire team are heading, down, heading back to play Vegeta. Bardock 
has since wakened after getting a very vague vision of Planet Vegeta's destruction. And, yep, seeing, seeing a vision of his wife Gine, his son, his two sons, Kakarot and Raditz. Before waking up, thinking, ah, it's all just a dream, and then he sits in the front seat of the pilot seat, much like he does in Dragon Ball Super Broly, and has his, has his conversation with the pilot. And that conversation with the pilot goes exactly the same like it does in Dragon Ball Super Broly. And ends with them landing, the entire team go their separate ways. The pilot and Bardock are still talking and they start begin discussing the realistic possibility that Frieza could be coming here to destroy the planet. Destroy them all. After all, he is aware, thanks to this pilot, that he is looking into the legend of this Super Saiyan and this Super Saiyan God? Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan God, oh. Yeesh, I wish Beerus would stop talking about that, honestly. <laughs> Alright, so. So that goes on per normal. But just before Bardock hits the diner, where he meets up with Gine, he has another vision, a more clearer vision of the planet being blown up, but this time, he sees the face of the being responsible for the destruction. And it is indeed the mighty Lord Frieza. He immediately runs to the diner, where of course he has his run-in with Gine. And he's about to tell, tell Gine what he has realized. But she's sort of distracting him right now with the whole... Uh, Raditz is on another planet with, um, with Prince Vegeta doing their own thing. He's joined the military. You want to see Kakarot? Let's have a look at Kakarot. There they are. Such a loving family. And so, while Bardock is, of course, staring at Kakarot, he then, of course, reveals his plan to send Goku away. So if you were wondering, do they send Kakarot away? Yes, they do. Just in a slight chance that Bardock, Bardock's plan actually fails. Honestly, the scene where they got to send Kakarot off like that in the movie always te always gets me tearing up a bit. Yep, Kakarot, I understand how you're feeling there. So I felt how I felt when I was separated from someone I loved. Bardock then fills Gine in on everything. His plan to send Kakarot off the planet, as well as his plan to stop this tragedy from even happening. And right now, Gine is the only person who believes him. Him and his entire team, of course. Now remember, in the Dragon Ball Super Broly timeline, Bardock's a lot more level-headed and karma. So later on, when he goes to the canteen, like from the Bardock special, and tells everyone what's happening, more people are more inclined to believe him because he's a lot more calmer and level-headed. Not to mention he's also better respected in the Dragon Ball Super Broly timeline. So yeah, he's not busting you with the ah, 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 Frieza, Frieza. So he actually convinces a few of them to join him. But Bardock knows the only way his plan is going to work is if he can unite all the Saiyans for this. He's going to need the help of every Saiyan there to do what he's thinking. And the only way he's going to be able to do that is if he goes before King Vegeta. Which he does. And if he can't convince him, he might need to convince Queen Kasava, King Vegeta's wife. which doesn't really go down too well at the beginning. Well, let's put it to you this way. A complete, a complete Saiyan brawl breaks out. King Vegeta and his royal guards take it on Bardock and his band of lower class Saiyans. But, as it turns out, Bardock and his band of lower class Saiyans are actually putting up quite a bit of a fight. So remember, Bardock and his team do mission after mission. 
Bardock comes back, back from most of his missions near death most of the time, so he's always getting the Zenkai boost. And he's actually powerful enough to actually match King Vegeta. And it's a pretty good fight, pretty awesome fight breaks out. But ultimately, King Vegeta is not having any of this. He doesn't believe for one second that Bardock can see the future, and that this so-called attack by Frieza is happening. And he, he, he pretty much just wants to throw him in the dungeon for even suggesting such a thing, you know. This, this is high treason! You'll get the death penalty for this, Bardock. And of course, Bardock's all, if you don't listen to me, you have doomed us all, King. And, well, and believe it or not, it's actually Queen Kasava who breaks up the fight. Queen Kasava, who's a bit more, less trusting of Frieza, and she seems like she'd be the more sensible of the two, actually decides to hear Bardock out and manages to convince King Vegeta that they cannot take this chance. They cannot take the chance that Bardock is actually telling the truth and that he's right. I mean, this is the entire Saiyan race we're talking about. And so, with a a bit of convincing, with a bit of convincing, King Vegeta does give the order for all Saiyans to meet by the palace. All Saiyans on world to meet by the palace. You see, by Frieza ordering all the Saiyans home to the one spot, Frieza has doomed himself. Now with a bit of confirmation with the few with the Saiyans there that have scouters, they are scouting and they can see not only that Frieza is here, but pretty much a lot of his men are out and about surrounding the ship. All of them with decent power levels, mind you. So you have Zar Zarbon and Dodoria are there, and all their lackeys and Frieza, of course. They can tell that Frieza is outside his ship. And then they begin to see a huge spike in power coming from that direction. It is Frieza charging up his attack to destroy the planet. There's no doubt. There's no doubt in King Vegeta or Queen Kasava's minds anymore. It's time to act now, or kiss the Saiyan race goodbye. The time to act is now. So, Bardock then fires up an energy ball and instructs every Saiyan present: Look up and fire everything you've got. And the Saiyans do just that. They look up at the energy ball and they begin transforming into the Great Ape. Bunch of Great Apes anyway. Quite literally, Frieza's worst nightmare come to life. And they look up. They're mean. They're ferocious. They're ready. But Ryan, how, how exactly is this supposed to stop Frieza? He's like, stronger than any sand. Yes one-on-one, -on -one, but all these Saiyans together, all of them transformed into Great Ape. Remember, the Great Ape transformation is a ten times multiplier. So, you're looking at Bardock, who was... power level was around the... 10,000, maybe 15,000 mark, somewhere like that. So, ten times multiplier, you got 100,000 or 150,000. Plus, all the other Saiyans there with equal, like the elites with equal power, and the lessers with less, you put all that together, you know, it would take Frieza in his final form to survive that. And unfortunately for Frieza, he doesn't have the time to transform. That blast is just sending Frieza's blast at him quicker than he can power up. Sorry, Frieza fans, Frieza is dead along with his ship, along with Zabon Dodoria, and anyone else unfortunate enough to be on that ship when it blew. The Saiyans were not wiped out this time around. So now we fast forward, Kakarot has landed on Earth, but strangely enough, Prince Vegeta, Nappa, and Raditz haven't come back yet. It's been a few months since, and since then, Bardock has actually gotten quite a big promotion since then. 
being declared the sa savior of the Saiyans. And Bardock, he's not really interested in joining the elite. He's not the, the Saiyan elite. He urges King Vegeta to to let him be in charge of training up the lower class. Now, the lower class, they go on more of the grunt. Because Bardock, remember, but Bardock is considered a lower class warrior himself. Bardock understands the potential the lower class Saiyans have, especially considering that he was able to match the king just now. And a bit grudgingly, King Vegeta's like, hmm, they're very well. Personally, I think you're wasting your time training up these lower grunts, but very well, since you saved our race, I will grant you your request. Now, in the few months that this has been going on, Nappa, Raditz, and Vegeta have not come back home. They are still missing, as it were. And Gine, she's she's a little worried. She's a little worried about, well, both her sons for that matter. Since Freeza's wiped out, she actually wants to get in a space pod and at the very least, go rescue Kakarot. But right now, King Vegeta is not letting anyone off the planet. He's not letting anyone off the planet. And why is that? The matter of King Cold. You see, King Vegeta knows eventually King Cold's going to come looking for his son. He's going to be looking for Freeza or get some confirmation of what has happened. And so far, they've been they've been basically just cut off contact from the freezer force. And that's not the only trouble that's going on. King Vegeta is also starting to notice how many people are starting to respect Bardock. Due to him being which is very unsettling for King Vegeta. Hmm. I don't get why they're worshipping this Bardock so much. I'm the king. I am King Vegeta. They should be bowing down to me. You know, a bit of that um Vegeta pri Saiyan pride that, you know, that sense of entitlement that we see Prince Vegeta in the in the main timeline have throughout the show. He's getting a bit of that. So. It's very possible a bit of a rivalry starting to form there between Bardock and the King. And Veg King Vegeta is not liking this one little bit. So with um, Planet Vegeta basically on um, complete planetary lockdown, no one's allowed in or out. It's um, yeah, it's very troubling. It's quite troubling for Bardock and Gine, who basically want to get in their space pods and look well. Gine mostly. Gine wanting to leave and find her children. But it's just not happening. Now as for Gine, she's actually getting stronger in this timeline. Because Bardock is now put in charge of training the lower class, Gine's more more keen to join in and get some training done herself. Because yes, because remember, it, She's especially more motivated by the fact that the fact of the matter is it was a lower class warrior that saved the same race from Frieza. He had all those premonitions. He had the tactical battle plan to use all the Saiyans great over his Aru trans transformations and wipe them all and wipe Frieza out. You know, Saiyan Elite? You know, this really was the wrong sort of thinking. You know, the type of thinking, you know, the Saiyans should never have had in the first place. But they only have that elite and lower class way of thinking because they were enslaved by King Cold and Lord Frieza. And that influence is going to remain for a little while, which is why King Vegeta is being as grudging, grudgingly towards Bardock as he is. And King Vegeta, he'd make often visits toward Bardock. He's like, huh, so how are these lower class dogs actually doing? I would prefer you do not address my men as lower class dogs, King. So there's definitely a bit of rivalry, a bit of a heat doing. These go my men are proving more, proving just as capable as your elite. Need I remind you, King, that it was a lower class warrior that saved our entire race. 
and you know, Vegeta's just sort of looking grudging as oh. a but he has to swallow his pride. With Bardock's raising popularity at the moment, if King Vegeta does anything to Bardock, this could end up turning the entire Saiyan race against him. Nah, if he's gonna do anything to Bardock, he's gonna have to wait. And that is when the scouters suddenly go off. Alarmingly, there is a huge power level heading towards them. Guess who? It is King Cold, looking for his son. King Cold is immediately requesting an audience with King Vegeta. And, well, King Vegeta, and King Vegeta alone. Remember, King Cold is not the type, he's not the type to just sort of jump in, all willy-nilly, kind of like the way Frieza was. King Cold's a bit more smarter and clever than that, and he's not just going to wipe out the Saiyans from orbit, because unlike Frieza, I always believe that King Cold sort of recognized the value of the Saiyans. So, at this point, he just wants to see King Vegeta. And King Vegeta agrees to go. Perhaps there's an opportunity here. Hey, King Vegeta, how do you do? Tell me. Have you seen my son Frieza around? His last transmission says he was heading towards planet Vegeta, but he hasn't checked in since. You wouldn't happen to know what has happened, have you? Rest assure you, King Cold's not an idiot. He knows what has happened. Doesn't know the exact circumstances, but he knows what his son was going to do. Well, don't get me wrong. I understand the need to defend yourselves. We would have all done the same thing if the situations were reversed. I just want the truth, is all. You tell me the truth? And we will leave things exactly the way they are. But if you don't, I will destroy you and your entire Saiyan race. And so King Vegeta, he was thinking about full-on lying to the king, you know, pretty much making up the same sort of story Frieza would have made up for wiping out the Saiyans, you know, the whole meteorite thing. He could have gone, oh well, Frieza was destroyed by a meteorite. But no, he decides it's best to tell the truth, and this might be an opportunity to teach Bardock a lesson. Actually, full on betraying, have him executed, so he actually tells the truth of what's happened. And he tells him that this this was all Bardock's doing. He um threw an energy ball in the sky and Saiyans transformed and they fired and killed your son. It was all Bardock. I said don't do it. I tried to stop him, but he just wouldn't listen. Oh, I see then. Well, I want you to bring this Bardock before me immediately. And if you do, I will return your son to you. The door opens, and you just got, got a vision. We just see Prince Vegeta in kind of like those, those shackles, but futuristic ones, the ones that Freezer Force would most likely use. Just sort of sta standing there with um, with Raditz, who's about the same age as Vegeta, and a, a really gigantic Saiyan of Nappa. Just standing there. You bring Bardock to me immediately, and I will return your missing Saiyans to you. One Saiyan for the price of three, including the Prince. What's it gonna be, King Vegeta? King Vegeta just sort of gets on his knees, does that whole thing, and goes, Very well, sire. And he leaves his ship. And he tells Bardock that he tells Bardock and his entire team that King Cold wishes to see them all in order to 
just to negotiate. He makes up some sort of lie. He tells them that they're that King Cold is, is simply wishing to negotiate the, the termination of their their contract, so to speak. To to end the enslavement of the Saiyans. He just wants to end it, let let bygones be bygones. And um Bardock, yeah, he's a he's he's Bardock about it. He's a he's very cautious about this. I'm like, hmm. What makes you think he won't just execute us when we arrive? Huh. Well if that were to happen, remember, you have me with you. And your entire team with you. I've seen your power, Bardock, it's on par with mine. Together we could take King Cold. If it comes to that. King Vegeta, of course, lying through his teeth. So, okay, they go up on a ship. And this is where Bardock gets another vision. He gets hit with another bit of a foresight. We don't actually see what that foresight is. I'm leaving that for a surprise later on in the video. But, when it's done, Bardock's just looking very, very suspiciously at King Vegeta. Very, very... Mm. Bardock knows something. Bardock knows what's about to go down. They then arrive in the ship. They arrive on King Cold's flagship and proceed to walk down the hallways. But something is wrong. It is completely deserted. There is nothing around. Not a soul. Hmm. Something funny about this. You know, if anything happens, you will have to explain it, King Vegeta. Vegeta just sort of mocks, walks off the com comment. Who is basically walking behind the rest of the team. Then, they are about to head into this really big room on the ship. And, at that moment, King Vegeta uses this chance, he's holding his arm up, he's ready to fire a powerful key blast right in the Bardock's back and end him. But before he can, suddenly, Bardock appears directly in front of him, like, chip, like looking, pretty much staring straight into the eyes of King Vegeta, and he says, I know what you're about to do, King Vegeta. You are a disgrace to the Saiyan race. <laughs> Grabs him by the arm, and he is twist. He is just twisting his up, snapping Vegeta's wrist. Ah, ah! How dare you portray the Saiyan race like this? And something is happening. Bardock is really furious and angry. He can't believe the cowardice of King Vegeta. That after what they just did to free the right Saiyan race from Freezer's grip, that he would just he would just throw it away, just so things could get back to normal. This you have never seen Bardock this furious. Remember the training with the low class, he's made stronger. It is Super Saiyan time for Bardock. He is that angry with the hair goes from black, it's sticking up, it goes from black to yellow. Bardock has transformed into a Super Saiyan. What? Impossible! That power is reserved for the Elite! It should be mine! Goodbye, your majesty, Bardock says, and fires a key blast, obliterating King Vegeta. And then, we see in that room they are suddenly surrounded by the entire Ginyu Force Just remember Ginyu Force isn't on for it wasn't on Freezer's ship the Ginyu Force did indeed survive they were on Freezer Planet 1 or I guess King Cole Planet 1 in this particular case and the battle is quite a fierce one it's quite it's quite a fierce one but with Bardock's Super Saiyan powers no one can even touch him. 
he just obliterates them all. Trying not to blow portholes in the ship and whatnot, but he's just obliterated them all. He does indeed, Bardock does indeed rescue Prince Vegeta, along with his son and Nappa, of course, and he orders everyone to get off the ship. Everyone, get off the ship now. King Cold is mine. He's flying around, he's got these nice Super Saiyan glow, and this is when he becomes face to face with King Cold. And oh, so you must be this Bardock person. How do you do? Say, um, how come your hair's not black and have you been dyeing it? Hmm, I kind of like it. Surely you know this ends badly for you. <laughs> ends badly for me? It's gonna end badly for you. Oh my, a monkey. With, um, a bit of backbone. Hmm. I can't say I like your insolent tone! And pretty much, fight breaks out between Bardock and King Kong. And, it's actually a pretty good fight. Now why is that? Um, you might be thinking, but Bar Bardock's a Super Saiyan, he should just be able to wipe out King Cold like that. Not necessarily. Keep in, mi keep in mind, Bardock's transformation is nowhere near as fluent and potent as Goku's transformation in the main timeline when, he, when Goku battles Freezer. King, uh, not King Cold, Bardock was still, is still significantly weaker than what his son was when he transformed, but he was just strong enough to pull off the transformation. The transformation can only bring someone's power level up to a certain amount, so the battle between Bardock and King Cold is a pretty close and fair one. It's pretty getting, you know, they're, they're both taking almost an equal amount of damage, Bardock having bits of his armor, destroyed and things like that. It's 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 quite the epic battle. It's all it's almost what you'd expect from Frieza and Goku on Namek. It's it's pretty much pretty much going like that. But Bardock is still the stronger one. And by digging down just a little bit more We don't work for you anymore and he's just wailing on King Cold. King Cold does not have a chance. This is just, as Frieza would say, this is just pure monkey brutality. And he's, and Cool is getting to the point where he's, um, he's pretty much ready to take out the entire ship. But Bardock just sees this coming. Oh! No you don't, you bastard! This is for everyone! You had me killing your name! Ah! <clears throat> he fires a huge, powerful key blast and just finishes off King Cold before he can do anything. As he should. After all, Bardock is not his son. There's no second chances here. Bardock is a true Saiyan. Alright, so after that you can pretty much imagine Bardock escapes the ship along with everyone else and is met with a hero's welcome. He did have to explain the, his actions on wiping out King, King Vegeta, but both Prince Vegeta and Queen Kasava completely understand. They completely understand why Bardock did what he did. Queen, even Queen Kasaba is disgusted with the actions of her husband. To, to, to basically put an end to all this progress they made in the last few months. Just so, just because he was jealous that Bardock was um, becoming a lot more respected. And Queen, Queen Kasaba... Um, is allowed to keep the throne as queen until Prince Vegeta becomes of age. But there is a condition. Bardock is insisting that Prince Vegeta trains with him 
so he can learn so he can start learning that there is no elite and lower class that every Saiyan is equal every Saiyan has a role to play if he can teach Prince Vegeta that then when he becomes king he might be a more well respected leader and Vegeta is keen to learn because well Bardock's a super saiyan Vegeta Vegeta wants that power for himself he he is definitely more keen keen to learn under Bardock and of course Raditz is willing to jump in as well so now that the whole Freezer and King Cold mess is over with, and King Vegeta no longer in charge, Gine, the wife of Bardock, mother of Goku and Raditz, hum, hum, or Kakarot in this case, humbly requests that she is allowed to take a space pod in order to retrieve Kakarot, who has been on Earth for the last three months. And Queen Kasama grants this request. After everything that this family has done for the Saiyan race, she can at least grant Gine this request so they can have their whole family back together. Remember that we're going off a combination of the Bardock TV special and Dragon Ball Minus. And it's well established that Goku is a lot older, is actually significantly older when they send him to Earth in Dragon Ball Minus. You know, he even had his Saiyan armor on. He's about he's about the age he is when Dragon Ball starts. And as we also know, the trip from Planet Vegeta Earth is about a year trip, so Gine is looking at a two year round trip at the least. Depending on if anything else delays her any longer. And you know what? We're gonna continue that story right now with this little side story. Because right, right now, well Gine's off finding finding her son Kakarot, Bardock is still training up the lower class soldiers and giving Vegeta his toot and Raditz their tutelage. And that's actually going well to this point. Vegeta's becoming a lot more respected. He's, he's, he's more respectful towards his fellow Saiyans, whether they're elite and lower class. He's, um, he's He's unlearning that Frieza and King Vegeta conditioning pretty quickly. Shockingly. A bit stubborn sometimes, like, huh, these aren't the Saiyans father talked about. What's going on here? We do get that occasionally, but he's learning that, you know, this is progress. This is what they need to become. Also plan planning with Queen Kasava some expeditions to start liberating all these other worlds that the Saiyans conquered in Lord Frieza's name. Because there is still quite a huge significant amount of the Frieza force left that's holding down the fort. But now that they're leaderless, this is their chance to, for the Saiyans to undo all the wrong they've done and restore the honor of the Saiyan race. And that's what's happening here. Now meanwhile, we've got Gine. She has now landed on Earth. She's gone to the exact coordinates that was um, punched in the Kakarot's space pod when they when they sent him off. So she's landed pretty much at the same spot as he did, and she's well. Keep him up. She's immediately got a scouter on, but she's having a little difficulty working on it. Why is that? Because remember, Gine's not very good at using the scouter. She she. She hasn't been in the field in years. She was mostly, she was mostly the cook. She she cooked all the food for the Saiyans. Probably one of the main reasons Bardock married her. She's she's a good cook. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so she's not very good at using the scouter. Now at this point, Gine is stronger than the than her original counterpart because she did do some training with the lower class soldiers with Bardock, as I said in the previous part. So she's actually stronger at this point. Um, from what she was, ac according to my sources, she was about 500, which is really weak for a Saiyan. She's about a thousand. She's at least doubled her strength since then. You know, she she quite enjoys training with her 
with a ho husband during the whole training part there. Anyway, so she is she landed roughly where Kakarot landed and she's immediately trying to pick up his trail and since this has been a year Goku is pretty much he's now he is now Goku he's had his bump on his head and he's pretty much already had his big pilaf adventure and he's currently on Roshi's island doing his training but Gine doesn't know that she's walking around the woods where Gohan found him and stumbles upon Goku's old house Goku's house, or Gohan's house rather. When she goes in there, she notices something on the table. It's a picture of her son with these other people. There's uh, Yamcha, Bulma, Poirin, Ulong. There's a picture of them together looking looking happy. So Gine is sort of happy and relieved because she, she knows her son was here, it's just where is he now? She knows he is alive out there somewhere. and. Looks like he's managed to make a couple of friends or, or something, which is not really what was supposed to be happy, happening. Kakarot was supposed to be conquering the planet, as we know. But it's it's interesting. It's definitely unbecoming. So Gine has got to investigate this a bit further. She really has to find a son, find out what's up with this. But she's not complaining. She she quite likes the surroundings of Planet Earth. Remember, Kine's pretty, really different than the rest of the Saiyans. So she's um flying around. She finally gets the scouter to work, but he, here's where she's having some some trouble. It's actually hard for her to find Goku because there there are more people out there who have roughly the same kind of power he does. We're talking, you know, Roshi, Yamcha, Krillin, you know, all the more advanced martial artists out there. You know, people who could match, you know, a Saiyan infant who was destined to be a lower class. So, Gini's really, he's like, huh, this is going to be harder than I thought. Kakarot, where are you? And, um, so, she is, um, looking around. Pretty much investigating all these higher powers, power levels that she can, and this um, eventually brings her to the island during the Tenkaichi Budokai, where um, Goku and Krillin are entering for the first time. And Gine, Gine is sort of um, curious, you know, so many, so many higher power levels in one spot. Huh? Oh, wonder what's going on here. And so she flies around. So she fly, flies to the island, you know, she's still got a Saiyan armor and all that on. She's not exactly blending in here, you know, in her tail wagging. <laughs> got, her, got her nice monkey tail there. And, um, yeah, and she comes to to a match and who does, who does she find? She finds, um, Goku battling the semifinals with Nam. She's just ecstatic to see her son, son fighting. You know, even though she wasn't really much of a fighter herself, she is just so proud to see her son fight. And, and you know, and she, he's not just a brute either. He's learned these martial arts. You know, he's actually quite tactical, this this kid. You know, and he, the way, the way he beats Nam, Gine is just proud, so proud. And, of course, then she um, we see the final match between... Jackie Chan slash Master Oshi and Goku in the final round. And they have and that battle pretty much goes the same as it does in the anime. Right up until the full moon. Uh oh, Gine do not look up. <laughs> nah, Gine was actually prepared for this. She managed to find a pair of sunglasses or something along the way. She was actually ready for this. She's trying to find Kakarot inconspicuously after all. She's not trying to draw attention to herself. So she knows full well she needs to take precautions when it comes to the moon. And you know, she just happened to find a pair of um, Roshi style sunglasses that were in Goku and Grandpa Gohan's house. Yes, I admit, I kind of borrowed that from Masako X's What If, but I reckon Gine would still take those as a precaution from the full moon. So. 
So Jackie Chan's got, got Goku in that um, in that energy wave where he's trying to torture Goku in a submission, but Goku ends up looking at the full moon and transforms into the great ape. And this is where things start to deviate a little bit from the original Dragon Ball story. Not by much, mind you, but a little bit. Goku is going on a bit of a rampage, but that quickly comes into a halt when someone yells from the audience, Kakarot! And even though Goku has lost most memory of Kine, I do believe in this particular state where Goku has no control of himself in his grade 8 form, something I believe would snap at the mention of his name. After all, this is his mother's voice. And Gine is ringing Kakarot in with his voice, so... There's no, there's no danger. He... Uh... Kakarot! Calm down! It's okay! Stop! And this actually gets Kakarot to, to calm down. He actually takes a really... He, he, he's basically like sitting in the ring nice, nice and calmly moving like this. It's, it, it's, it's just adorable. <laughs> but, now, does um, Jackie Chan um, destroy the moon? No, because while he's calm like that, Yamcha basically gets plot at changing a pair of scissors and they cut off his tail just like they did before during the Pilaf saga. Goku reduces to his normal form. But everyone is sort of um, shocked to see this woman who was supposedly able to bring Goku in. And she's basically, they, they, they're sort of um, trying to find her now, but she sort of um, disappeared. Like I said, she's not trying to really bring attention to herself. And of course, Goku wakes up and the battle continues. Kine's still around, but she's sort of floating way up in the air, looking down on the action. And it's the, the final bit of the battle. Jackie Chan and Goku do their last bit of a bit of a martial art fight, punches and kicks, do their final charge, boom, and the fight ends exactly the same way, with Jackie Chan ultimately getting the victory. And um they have their little settle down and talk at the end, and um Goku asks for the Raider, because it's been about a year now since the incident with Pilaf, now he can go and search for Grandpa's ball. And he goes off to do that like in the anime. And just as he's uh, about to exit the door and run run off, he is stopped by Gine. And Gine sa basically says, I was watching you fight. I am so proud of you. Uh... Um, thank, thank you, mister. Because remember, Goku at that age still had trouble working out um, whether, you know, who was a boy and who was a girl. And, and, and Kine is just sort of looking, she, she's just ha happy to see her son again. And she's like, do, do you remember me? Do you remember me at all? Trying to gesture to his tail, is that? Uh, uh, no, I, I don't know you, ma'am. Um, wh what? What? You have a tail! And, um, G Gina just, at that moment, just hugs her son. Hugs her son and is like, oh, Look how much you've grown in such a short time. Because you remember, when Goku... Goku was born, his power level was basically 2. He's now approaching, I think at this point, he's nearly approaching the 100 mark, 150. Quite, quite a big growth in that, you know, in the span of roughly, you know, a couple of years. Or a year and a half. And while she's hugging, um, Kini sort of gets a, a bit of a look on shock on the face because Goku does that thing. You know that thing Goku does when he can't tell the difference between a boy and a girl? You know, that thing? Yep, you're a girl, alright? <laughs> you know, and that cute sort of look he does when he does that? Kini is just like, ah! Were you raised in the woods? Uh, 
Yes, um, I actually was. What am I doing standing around here? I've got to find Grandpa's ball. And he basically runs off on the flying Nimbus and flies off. So Gine pretty much missed, missed her chance to really talk to her son and tell, tell, her, tell him about his origins. Since then, the same races have uh, lived pretty prosperly and peacefully. Bardock is still training up the lower class soldiers and is, of course, the local Super Saiyan. Which um, Prince Vegeta is now train currently training under Bardock's tutelage because Bardock wants to teach Prince Vegeta, you know, to respect his lower, the lower class warriors because we they need to get rid of that type of thinking because the elite Saiyans and lower class Saiyans that was all a type of thinking that Frieza and his father put into them when they enslaved them. What the Saiyans were really like, they were equal. They were equal and had a evenly, equally passion for battle. That that was it. Bardock is trying to bring that back, and to in order to satisfy their thirst for battle, Bardock is basically with Queen Kasava authorization. He's leading some liberation mi missions in order to liberate the planets that the Saiyans conquered in the name of Frieza. This is the only way to restore the honor of the Saiyan race. We have to right our wrongs. And, for the most part, yeah, everyone's behind it. In Vegeta, you know, you still get your little, ah, oh, why are we doing this? This isn't the Saiyans, or I was, this, this isn't what I was taught. He still gets a bit, bit of that, but, you know, that's pretty much normal. And meanwhile, this point because now with the realization from the others who were still at the tournament and have run into this woman who's having a bit of a bit of a lengthy conversation with Goku um, were wondering who she was and she revealed the fact that yes she is indeed Goku or rather Kakarot's mother and that they're all surprised but and again it's kind of obvious you know the tail and all and so that they're, they're just you know burning with questions and ultimately Gine fills them in. She tells them all about the Saiyan race, all about the Great Egg transformation, what the Saiyans were and everything, that they have that they sent Kakarot because their planet was in threat of Lord Frieza and Gine's basically come to take her son back. And um, you know and unfortunately she just missed the chance to tell Goku who she was and and you know, R R Krillin basically just pipes up. Well, if you if you come with us to Master Roshi's island, Goku's bound to come back sooner or later. And at this point, yeah, Gine's thinking, yeah, that's probably for the best. And that's exactly what she decides to do. And you know, and Gine also sort of mentions, you know. She, she's not entirely sure what she wants to do yet because she's she has um, experienced what her son is like she she's basically come aware that he hasn't really got any memory of her so she's got to sort of come to terms with that is it really right to take Kakarot back now that he's got this loving family and group of friends who really love and care for him is it really right for her to just come in and take him back like that and you know and considering his personality his sweet innocent like personality what are the other Saiyans gonna do to him you know there's that risk as well he you know he could be executed for being for being a sweetie pie you know who, who knows you know there is a certain amount of risk if Gine takes him back. So she decides to stick around for a while in order to properly assess the situation and come to a decision. Which is kind of cool and um, Roshi actually fills Gine in on the fact that Goku hit his head when he was a child. Because remember, Roshi was aware all along that Goku is from outer space because Grandpa Gohan told him that he found a boy in some sort of weird spaceship with a 
with a tail and that he used to be grumpy and more evil, you know, what, what a sand should be like until one day he fell and hit his head. So, Gine is a, a bit sort of torn up and heartbroken about that because that meant Goku has lost his memory of his parents, his brother. And it's quite the bitter pill for Gine to, to swallow, but it's probably not a bad thing because he does have a good life here now. And pretty much, and meanwhile, um, back on planet Vegeta and or in space, um, Bardock, is Bardock wondering what's taking his wife so long to find, um, find Kakarot? Yes and no, but he's more, he's more or less busy on his duties of training up Prince Vegeta, teaching him humility, as well as going, going with, um, his Saiyan brethren on these liberation missions and just freeing up the universe of all of Frieza's influence. Which is going significantly well at this point in time. And when we get to back with Gine, pretty much the things with Goku and the Red Ribbon Army pretty much play out the same right up till the events of when he um, eventually returns to Roshi's Island because they need to borrow the submarine to get the Dragon Ball. And this is when um, Gine actually goes with him. Gine goes with him on this submarine mission, along with Krillin and Bulma. And they, they're, they're off to find this Dragon Ball, and this is an opportunity for Gine to get to know her son a little better, so she's having a bit of a, bit of a, trying to have a bit of a talk with him. And Goku get, get, goes through the door, in fact, he's like, oh hey, it's, it's you, you're that nice lady from the tournament who was talking to me. You have a tail. <laughs> yes, Goku remembers the tail. But does Gine tell Goku that she's his mother? No, not yet. Not at this point. He doesn't know how Goku would be able to really handle the truth of his origins just yet. So Gine is willing to play that along and just play along and just um just talk with the kid, get to know him, and go and Goku's back while they're on. On their way to get this dragon, well, Goku's basically filling her in with all these, trying to fill her in with all these adventures until um, they get interrupted by General Blue and his submarines trying to blow them out for water, <laughs> and they're <laughs> fleeing for their lives, and they end up through the pirate cove and all that. Their battle with um with the pirate robot, you know that really cool, awesome-looking pirate robot isn't anywhere near as um, close as it is in the original anime because you got Gine there as well and Gine is remember she's stronger than her original counterpart in this story she is an absolute like 500 is a beast for someone living on earth at that point of the story a thousand is like well we remember Raditz when he turned up, the power difference between the heroes. Yeah, that, that robot is um, a pile of scrappy. And, of course, there is a bit of confusion and everyone gets separated with General Blue changing the directions and all that. Goku has his one-on-one -on -one fight with that man-eating octopus and has a good meal out of it. Ironically, <laughs> and um, eventually, um, Goku does end up going in the correct direction, and he finds that Bulma, Krillin, and even Gine are kind of on their knees. You know, Blue, General Blue's um, paralysis, but and pretty much that fight between Goku and Blue pretty much goes the same what it does in the anime. And um, Goku, you know, dives after the ball and they end up 
going going back to the summary, that all plays out, and uh, Bulma was considering leaving Goku, just like he she does in Dragon Ball, but, you know, Gine, Gine's refusing to leave too. Gine, Gine won't leave, leave her son behind. And, um, with that, just like before, Goku does arrive on time, and there's a big race to get out, and he gets stuck, run out of fuel and all that, and Goku does this big Kamehameha! And they launch right out of the ocean. And at this point, at this point in the story, you know, they go back to Roshi Island, who, of course, Roshi has completely beaten the beaten the Red Ribbon Army senseless, just like in the original story. And um, and yeah, after retrieving the Dragon Ball, Dragon Balls, and of course, they all end up paralyzed by um by General Blue, but not before Launch, of course, runs off with the diamond, which, luckily, because that's how they get out of that mess, including Gina, she gets tr paralyzed again, and Goku is basically chasing after General Blue. Now, big difference here is, is that Gina is coming along for, for the ride. She's starting to realize just how dangerous and how much danger her son's putting himself into. So Gine is actually following him. And they end up in that, you know, that weird, that weird sort of penguin village, I think it's called? Yeah, penguin village. They end up in penguin village and that pretty much plays off similar to the anime, except with Gine completely losing track of her son. And, uh, because remember, she can't sense power levels. She can't sense power levels, and she ran off in a rush and left her scouter behind. So, at this point she's thinking that it's simply best that she goes back home and goes back to Roshi's Island and retrieves the scouter so she can find her son again. And the whole... Blue being killed by Tao happens per normal, as long as well as the first fight between Goku and General Tao. Or Mercenary Tao, whatever you want to call him. And since and in the meantime, Gine has indeed picked up her scouter and she's on her way, flying to her son's location. The first fight between Mercenary Tao and Goku goes exactly as it does in the story, with Goku nearly ending up in near death. And Gine can sense her son's power level, can sense with the scouter her son's power level going down. And this horrifies her. She's flying at full speed now to get there on time. Tao has since evacuated. And by the time Gine's there, she just sees um, the little Indian boy, Upa, crying over the de death of um, his father, as well as apparent, the apparent death of Goku. And Gine, she's just stunned. She's like, no, no, not my Kakarot. She, she is partially devastated. But before she starts the grieving and tearing up herself, she notices Goku starting to move and getting up. Ow, that really hurt! As we know, he survived thanks to his grandpa's ball, which he managed to find. He had that... He had that tucked away in his shirt, and that protected him from General Tao's third on wave. And... Does Gine choose to... engage with her son? Um, actually, yes, yeah, she wanted to make sure he's alright, you know. Her, her maternal instincts are kicking in. She still does not tell Goku who she is. But Goku is curious, why do why you keep following me? And she just says, she just basically says, let's just say I will always watch over you. And um, then Goku of course decides, I'm going to climb Corrin's tower and drink the sacred water. And Gine's stunned because she, she only just got there. She doesn't know any of this 
this stuff on what's going on. Say, sacred water? What's that going to do? But Goku's already off like a shot. <laughs> Straight to Korin's tower and that whole train goes as per... per normal. Gine's trainer actually decides to stay there and tries to comfort Upa and helps her with... helps him with... Um, and she assures you, you know, if anyone can stop Mercenary Tao and get revenge, it's going to be her son. If he can't, he, he, she tells Upa not to worry because Gine will step in before the worst happens. And then Goku comes down and the rematch begins and that goes exactly as it does in the anime. He's like, and tells him, ha, you drank the second water, did you? And he runs off to try and do the same thing and we know how that goes. Gine's like, Goku, why are you worried? Oh, it's just regular tap water. <laughs> And, you know, and Tao has his big crash landing, just like he does, and round three begins. And that goes exactly the same way. Gine does not have to interfere. But Gine can't help but wonder if Goku's real, real strength wasn't just from uh, the training of Korin, as well as the Zenkai boost he would have gotten from being pushed to near death by Mercenary Tao. And yes, he would have gotten a Zenkai boost. And of course... That match ends the same way, and then Goku makes his decision. I'm gonna charge the Red Ribbon Army, get those Dragon Balls, and put an end to this once and for all. <laughs> and he's off again on his Nimbus, and Gine just got. She's. It's it's a strange plan for Gine. Her son's a strange one, <laughs> but he's definitely a Saiyan, all right. Always in need, always in need of a fight. <laughs> and so, Gine decides to follow, follow along. <laughs> and for a military compound, Gine is just surprised that this military base is just letting them in. Ah, well, it's probably just mercenary Tao. Because remember, because remember, with they are only able to spot Goku coming because he's got the Dragon Balls on the radar. I don't know if I don't know or think Gine would actually show up on radar. I don't know. You can let me know in the comments about that. Actually, if you, if you, you know, if um, if I'm wrong there, then that would just mean that Gine gets gets rained on by a bunch of military weaponry. But, I don't know, I don't think um, a radar would detect a, a flesh body flying. I don't know, I'm not too familiar about how radars work, unfortunately. But anyway, so she's following close behind. She's close behind her, her little son. And um, Goku's, um, the whole Red Ribbon Army thing, goes pretty much the same way. Except for the battle between Goku and now Commander Black in his big robot suit. G Gine is watching her son being wailed on by this robot and she's not having any of it. When it, get, when it gets to the point where it's pretty much to the point where Goku is going to lose to the robot, Gine just fires up a key blast and destroys the robot. She doesn't want her son getting hurt. She doesn't. I mean, she is a mother after all. <laughs> but Goku's a little, uh, a little upset. Uh, but I wanted to beat him. <laughs> uh, but still, Red Ribbon Army defeated by child. And pretty much, Gina and Goku eventually find Roshi and the others who have come to assist as well. And Goku is off trying to find the last ball so they can make their wish with with the Eternal Dragon and the whole fortune teller Baba thing happens. And it's um until Goku gets himself gets himself um, a new speck of clothes. So remember they get wrecked during that whole Red Ribbon army thing until he gets his um 
tell her McGee done, he needs to wear something else. And he doesn't get he doesn't have to wear that really ridiculous outfit that he has. No, mummy's come prepared. She found one of those dino cat things and also found Kakarot's space armor and told him to put this on. He can wear that in the meantime. You don't like it, you can change it back into his gi. You know? And it's it's kind of adorable, Vagina, you know, see, seeing her son again in her in his space armor. And um let's face it, it's pretty cool. We all we've all wanted to see Goku in space armor. So this is a little little treat for you. Dragon Ball fans who always wanted to see Goku in space armor, there you have it. Briefly as it might be, because he gets his gear like he does. And the whole bar Fortune Teller Barber part of the story plays out as per normal, including the final match with Grandpa Gohan, who spots Gine in the background and he is wondering, hmm, a, a tail just like just like Goku. Now Gine was almost going to interfere with the match, seeing what Gohan was doing to to her son, you know, with the tail slamming him constantly in the ground. Gine was actually getting angry enough to interfere, but Roshi insists, no, we have to let this play out. Grandpa Gohan would have intentionally hurt his grandson. He's doing this for a reason. We gotta trust his judgment. And Gine's just sort of standing there half out like, and of course, the tower eventually comes down and Goku's doing his funny little dance there. Ah! Ow! 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 I always told you this would be your weakness. You have to work on your weaknesses. We get that whole speech. And, um... And Grandpa Gohan is curious about Gine. Now, he doesn't say anything in front of Goku, but he does sort of um, go off and have a bit of a private conversation with Gine. Are you Goku's mother? And she's like, yes, but don't tell him just yet. I'm, I'm not ready for him to know just yet. That that sort of thing. And she basically gives him a quick filling in on the Saiyans and what they're like and the full moon and whatnot. And he's sort of intrigued, but he doesn't really have time to really talk about it because his um, day past the stay in this world is about to expire. But he has a good chat with his grandson who's just happy to see him. And Kina is just so warmed up and heartfelt by this. She's... You know, she's realizing, you know, it's, maybe it's not such a good idea to, maybe it's not just such a good idea to bring Kakarot back, and, you know, her, her heart's sort of broken at the same time, too, because, you know, Gine's his family, too. Uh, I'm sorry, um, if, if I'm tearing up a little bit, it's just, um, stories like this, um, I'm quite sensitive to them, I tear up a little bit. Um, but yeah, so, with that, we basically get to the whole, that whole thing then finishes up, wraps up, and Goku gets his final Dragon Ball, has his battle with Pilaf, and gets his, gets his wish, with the Eternal Dragon. And of course, Upa's father comes back and Gine is just so proud of her son. I mean, what, what he has done for this person, for this kid, it's, it's just heartwarming and beautiful. She couldn't be more proud of her son. And I think with that done, Who runs off on his own per his master, Master Roshi's instruction, to learn from the great greatest teacher of all, life. No fly nimbus, travel the world, travel the world, get stronger in every way, not just in martial arts, but in mind. Learn from the greatest teacher of life. Gine wanted to go with her son do some training with him, but Roshi insisted that this is something 
Goku has to do on his own. And so, and that whole training period goes exactly as per normal with Yamcha joining, um, doing the Turtle Hermit school training and Gine hanging out with them and also assisting with the training there. All right, so with that in so with that in mind, the training pretty much goes exactly the same, except that Gine is there helping Krillin and Yamcha train as well. You know, keep it all fair. And um, when the tournament actually comes around, um, the match between Tien and Yamcha pretty much plays out the same. Yamcha's a bit stronger, but he's still no match for Tien. And of course, um, Roshi, the disguised Jackie Chan, has his victory over over the Wolf Man, and Chao Tzu loses to Krillin, and Goku ends up fighting with Gine. Yes, Gine has entered the to tournament and has took Pumpet's spot, and they have a little bit of a match. Goku ultimately gets the win. He's not um. It's more like a friendly sparring match, and Gine just wants to get a, a bit of an assessment of where where her son's at in terms of power and, and strength, and she, she's just wanting to have a little fun with her child. And ultimately, she basically she does she does push Goku a bit. She does push Goku a bit, but she does ultimately give him the win. Sort of giving her a nice bit of a, as she sort of walks walks away when she's kicked out of a ring by one of Goku's kicks. It's a pretty good match. It's a much better match than watching Goku beat some guy that we knew he was going to beat. And um, and then we got the semi-finals that play out exactly the same as in the story, along with Tien's fight with Goku, which ultimately ends with Tien winning the tournament. Becoming friends and celebration, celebrate dinner. But then Goku realizes he's left his Dragon Ball behind, and Krillin's gone back to get it for him. And then there's that unsettling feeling in the pit of Goku's stomach. And for once, it's not hunger. He is concerned for his friend. He is worried. Why hasn't he come back yet? And eventually, it just gets to him to. It just gets to him to the point where he suddenly runs off. Krillin! Goku! And um, he just storms up back to the arena where he sees the, the, the announcer, the tournament announcer guy. He's knocked out and Krillin is lying there motionless. He's dead. And... Of course, not too long after that, the rest of the gang show up. Gine is horrified. Everyone is just horrified, Gine especially. Gine is well aware of the relationship between Goku and Krillin. This is his best friend. This is something Gine was kind of hoping her son would never have to deal with. Because at this point, she is, she was pretty much thinking on the terms of letting Kakarot stay here and just go back to Planet Vegeta herself. Just tell everyone you know, she never found him. You know, that sort of gist. But now, we're entering the King Piccolo Saga. Now things are really gonna get good. <laughs> Alright, so... And we pretty much know what happens here. Goku pretty much goes, Bama, give me a Dragon Raider! And he... He's taking off. Once again, as he always does, so impulsive and reckless, typical Saiyan monkey. No one's thinking straight. They they let Goku go. Not even Gine fought to really stop him. And um, then Roshi, of course, he's the insignia that this is the insignia of King Piccolo, nasty demon who terrorizes planet once before, brought it to the brink of becoming a wasteland, basically, and. You know, this is like, this is something like in the terms of like Lord Freezer. Gine hoped there would never be a threat like this on this planet. 
something like this her son is now going to have to face. So she is worried as heck. Oh, sorry. That'd be my positive alarm. Hang on. No, I love her too. You heard nothing. My ears only. So anyway, where was I? Um, yeah, yeah. So Goku has flown off all half cocked and goes after Tambourine, and we know how that goes the first time around, and eventually meets up with the Arjirobi and the whole everything leading up to when to Goku's first fight with King Piccolo pretty much plays out the same. Meanwhile, Gine has decided to help Roshi, Tien, and Jiaotsu. Roshi, Tien, Jiaotsu get the Dragon Balls before Piccolo. And when that happens, and of course, Goku's on his way to Korra's Tower after being beaten to near death, and of course, King Piccolo, kind of like in Massacre X's What If, I don't really like borrowing things from him, but it, but anyway, it, it, it works. He, Piccolo, Piccolo um, is battling with Gine when they have their, where Roshi makes his little stand with Piccolo and has his little battle with, yeah, but King Piccolo has his battle with Gine, who is just thrashing him. Remember, she's even stronger than what she was in this timeline. She's, she's a thousand. She's double what she is in Masako's What If. And, um, Piccolo, he does try that little cunningly scheme about her son. You know. <laughs> You're that monkey boy's mother, aren't you? That child I beat so easily. He is dead. Go on, sense him. Roshi taught you, I'm sure. And, rest you, she has learnt to sense energy since then. Spending all that time with Earthling, she was able to pick it up during that time gap between the training and the second Tenkaichi Budokai. Where Tien just won. So yes, she senses, she's trying to sense her son's energy, she, she can't sense a thing. And while her guard is down, Piccolo attacks Kine and gets a really good shot in. And then, Roshi tries the Martha Bar. Or Evil Containment Wave, if, you, if that's easier for you. He, Piccolo does get caught, does get caught up on it, but the lid ends up closing like it does in the anime, and the shot is missed. And Roshi, who's pretty much weakened after that, Piccolo just does away with Roshi. And of course, Tien being Tien being knocked out and sprayed by Chiaotzu, pretty much. Yeah, big mistake there, Roshi. You pretty much gave up the. You pretty much gave out the rest of your backup. He he was pretty sure that Gine. You know, Roshi was pretty sure Gine and Roshi would be enough, but you know, Piccolo just pushed the Gine button, and Piccolo was able to wound Gine enough to basically knock her out. Remember, when someone's guard is down, they're completely vulnerable. We, we only got a look at that incident with Sorbet with the raid gun in Dragon Ball Super when he blasts Goku when his guard's down. You'll be the strongest one in the world, but once your guard's down, you get hit even by someone with a measly 200, you can be taken down quite easily. This is the case I'm making here. And so, Piccolo uses the Dragon Balls, he restores his youth, just like in the anime, and destroys the dragon. So Krill Krillin... And Chiaotzu and now Roshi are not, uh, right now, not coming back. And then comes the next part. Yamcho is still reeling from his injury, and now Tien and Gine are both mastering the Mafaba. They're both out mastering the Mafaba. Of course, Gine is thinking, I'm just going to end Piccolo the next time I see him. But the Marfa Bar, probably the better option. And meanwhile, Goku has made it to Korin and has gone through the whole 
drinking the uh, ultra divine water. Sorry, yeah, drinking the ultra divine water and has gotten stronger. I'd say his power level is, is really close to almost the 400 mark, 450 mark, where Piccolo, Piccolo is more or less around the same. Because as we know, Goku and Piccolo's power levels were pretty, King Piccolo's power levels were pretty even, were pretty well even. And we have the whole, the battle between Tien, Tien and Piccolo. And since there are two of them there, they got two of these warriors. Now remember that Piccolo knows how, how powerful Gine is. He's pretty much ready for her this time. He's got a bunch of his little legion and warriors there to greet them. He knew they'd be coming back. So that's a bit of differentiation, um, a bit of difference from the original story. Piccolo is ready for him this time. He knew they he knew Tien and Gine would be back eventually, and the whole battle ends up even. You know, Gine power levels a thousand, but against a bunch of these monsters, she's gonna be having trouble, much like Raditz would. Like when I put him in the same situation in what if King Piccolo won. You can check out that video if you want, it's in the description or in the Dragon Ball video playlist somewhere. Definitely check that out. Anyways, back to the story. So, they're not having much luck in capturing Piccolo, and Tien does use the Marfa Bar, and he does manage to capture one of those monsters, but he ultimately doesn't capture King Piccolo like in the original story. And, just when all hope seems lost, that is when Goku sh shows up. Power level 450, and he's going one-on-one -on -one with, King, with King Piccolo. While Tien, the only thing Tien can really do is do his best to try assist Gine, who has pretty much taken out the rest of those monsters. I, I didn't say she'd lose to those monsters, I said she'd be struggling a bit. Meanwhile, Goku and Piccolo, King Piccolo, are having their battle, which pretty much plays out exactly the same in the, as in the story. The whole thing, and Gine is watching in astonishment, the, the sudden boost of power of her son, how much stronger he's become in that period of time. It's surprising for her, I mean, and ultimately she's just so happy that her son's alive, and Piccolo and Goku are having that epic battle, um, Tien does get, um, does get taken hostage by Piccolo like he, like he does, but before picking Piccolo could do anything about it, um, Gine basically just snatches T T yeah, out of her hands, out of his hands. Remember, she's a power level of a thousand, so she'd be moving like lightning compared to these guys. But Gine is deciding she's going to let Kakarot handle this. Gine has finally come to her decision, and you know the whole "ah, uh, it's time for your turn to end." Uh! And King Piccolo is defeated. He is defeated by Goku, and Goku is in pretty good condition. He didn't really get that badly damaged this time, because Piccolo wasn't able to take his advantage of his weakness for his friends, because Gine was there to make sure this fight stayed fair. Good on you, mum! Oh wait, I don't know you're my mum yet. But, he is now about to. Gine has made her decision. After seeing Goku save the world for, for the second time, Gine now understands that this is where Goku belongs. Or Kakarot. And so, she decides to have a good, bit of a sit down with her son. All the others are still arriving. And she sits down to her son and tells her how proud she is of him. I'm so proud of how far you've grown. To think you used to be such a little, adorable little baby I could hold in my arms. And this is where Goku asks the, asks the question, 
Who are you? And Gine passes up. My name is Gine. I am your mother. Your real name is Kakarot. You are from the planet Vegeta. You were sent here by your father and I when Lord Freezer was threatening to destroy our planet. We had to save you. It was always our intention to come back for you. And, um... She fills him in about who the Saiyans were and everything. She, tell, she tells him everything and lays it all on the line for him. And, um... It's really a heartbreaking moment because Gine is telling him that I have to go. I I can't stay here anymore. I'm, and I, can, I don't have the heart to take you away from your family and this planet that needs you. But I am proud as... I am proud of you, my son. And Goku... Goku is tearing up she he's he's met his mother that whole mystery is solved for him he's been curious about who Gine was from the beginning since he she sort of wandered into his life and now he knows and why she, well, he, he just stays on planet earth with his new family who clearly love him and after Goku defeats King Piccolo. Gine has come to her decision. She then reveals to Goku who she really is. That she was his mother. That she is his mother, I should say. And and of course, that's all emotional. Ka Goku is happy. He finally gets to meet his mother. Although, kind of obvious, you know. The tale. But Goku's never really been the brightest one of the bunch. And Gine had to lay the hard truth that it is now time for her to go back so she can help her father Bardock restore the honor of the Saiyan race and rid the universe of the Freezer Force once and for all. And as that's about to happen, they still got to deal with the immediate crisis on how do they get Master Roshi, Shoutsu, and Krillin resurrected now that the Eternal Dragon is destroyed. And well, that answer is about to come because suddenly, back on Roshi's Island, they're all sitting there discussing it. Suddenly, a lightning bolt from the sky hits the ground, revealing, revealing this being. A very familiar looking being. In fact, he looks a lot like King Piccolo. Much like he used to look like before he used the Dragon Balls to restore his youth. And of course, Goku. And pretty much everybody mistaken from King Piccolo and everyone's charging. Charging this mysterious being, of course. It's Kami. And Kami just basically... Knocks them all away with a flick of his energy. Which is pretty cool. And he reveals that he reveals the truth that his name is in fact Kami and that him and Piccolo were once one being. He created the Dragon Balls and all that. And he's willing to allow the Earthlings to use the Dragon Balls to resurrect their friends, but on one condition. Gine and Goku go to the lookout with him in order to do some training because Kami is aware that Piccolo Jr. is around, that King Piccolo spawned an egg before his death, and Piccolo Jr. will be there to challenge Goku and Gine at the next Tenkaichi Budokai in three short years. And in order to make, make sure that they are ready for that, they must train at the lookout with him, because Kami can't do it himself. And, um, Gine want was I'm supposed to leave the planet she's supposed to go back to planet Vegeta but you know she's not gonna leave her friends on earth you know dead because that's the conditions of having the Dragon Balls recreated and the dragon resurrected Kami created the Dragon Balls he can do that so Gine agrees to do that and Goku of course is happy because this means he gets three more years with his mother 
who he's only just really officially met. You know, we, we couldn't really break up the family like that. So, there we go. And the free, the dragon is resurrected, Roshi, Krill, and Chiaotzu are brought back. And the train between Goku, Gine, training with Kami begins, and the three years go by as per normal. Except with the addition that Gine and Goku are pretty much going at it at the lookout at full ball, because Gine is really wanting to bridge the gap between her power level and her son's. Remember, Goku is still considerably weaker, so Gine and Goku are able to train a lot harder, a lot harder taking advantage of the Zenkai boost. For those who don't know, that is when a Saiyan takes injury and battle damage in battle, and then they heal and they become stronger for it. So they're taking full advantage of that, and Sensu Beans, and all that, and this actually... They're able to bridge Goku's power gap from Gine's power pretty quickly. And now the three years have gone by, and it's time for the Tenkaichi Budokai. And throughout most of the prelimi preliminaries play out per normal, except one difference. Gine's entering the tournament as well. Goku and Gine need to make sure that at least one of them faces Piccolo Jr. in the final. And of course Kami is there too, disguised as Hero. And um, and Chao Tzu does his whole switching the, the numbers around so none of the Z-Warriors have to really fight each other in the tournament, but because Gine is an extra person, she ends up in the same, in the same tournament ring as um, Chao Tzu. But, like in the anime, Chiaotzu is beaten by Tao. Chiaotzu is eliminated early by Tao, and, and then eventually Tao ends up fighting Gine, and that is just interesting. That, that's just interesting, because remember, Gine was there when Tao battled with Goku, when Goku beat him during the whole Red Ribbon story arc. Ah! So you're that one who was with that Rugrat who beat me, who did this to me. I will take pleasure in killing you in front of him. She's not talking. She remembers that Tao almost killed her son. Nah, this is personal. And with one strike, Tao is eliminated. In fact, he is flying through the arena wall. And into the food stands. And pretty much um, out of the tournament grounds at all. Is he alive? Yes, so Gine's not disqualified. But, needless to say, Mercenary Tao is not going to be causing any more trouble. And the rest of preliminaries go on as per normal, and then we get to the round of the fin finals in the tournament. First match, as I. Let's see if I remember this correctly. It is. Yeah, it, was, it would have been originally Tien vs Mercenary Tao, but because Mercenary Tao has been defeated, it is now Tien vs Gine in the first round. And it's a pretty it's a pretty good match, but of course Gine is really holding back, because the power difference between Tien and Gine is pretty monstrous, and she's got to reserve her energy for when, she, when either her or Goku have to battle with Piccolo Jr. But, ultimately, Gine picks up the win. Uh, is Tien disappointed about the loss? No, he actually had a good time fighting Gine, and he knows that Tien knows he's just simply going to have to work harder so he can improve as well. In the second match, Goku ends up fighting Anonymous, aka Chi-Chi, and that whole chestnut plays out as per normal, with Gine a bit curious to who this person is, because remember, when Ge all of Gine's appearances in Goku's life, she missed out on the little run-ins Goku had with Chi-Chi during their childhood. And that whole thing plays out. That match plays out as per normal, Chi-Chi being angry at Goku, because Goku has um, does not recognize her. And um, that whole thing's going... Hey, um, Miss Anonymous Lady, can you, um, can you just, uh, tell me what it is I forgot so I can remember? You promised to be 
You promised I'd be your bride! You promised to marry me! And um, that whole thing plays out, and of course, Anonymous only agrees to tell Goku who she really is, if Goku can defeat her, which of course he does, just like in the anime, and she reveals that she's the Ox, King da Ox King's daughter, Chi-Chi, and Goku ends up proposing to her after the match, just like that. So Gine actually got to witness her son get engaged to the woman he loves. <laughs> Typical saying, they always go for the strong women. <laughs> now, the rest of the semi finals pretty much play off as per normal uh, with um, Yamcha's humiliating defeat against Hero, aka the disguised Kami, and Piccolo Jr. defeats Krillin. And then we move on to the semi-finals. The biggest difference in the semi-finals being that Goku and Gine battle each other in, in the semi-finals. And that is a pretty intense match because they're not holding back. Gine's not holding back her power this time. Gine needs to make sure that whoever faces Junior has to be the best person for the job. And it is a pretty good match. And Goku... And Gine, they're ultimately having a lot of fun. They're having a lot of fun with this, but ultimately, it is Goku who gets the win. Goku has surpassed his mother. And then, we've got the match between Kami and Piccolo, and that pretty much plays off per normal. The nameless Namekians, two halves, going at it like they're at war with each other. And of course, Kami tries to use the Marfa Bar on Piccolo and tries to trap him. But Piccolo is, of course, ready for this. He's seen this technique enough times to learn how to reverse it. <laughs> that looks fun. Can I play too? Evil containment wave. Reverse! And he completely reverses it on Kami and catch it, captures him in that little bottle. Just like it goes in the anime. And then we head to the final match. Goku... Goku versus Piccolo, and that plays out exactly the same as it does in the anime, with Goku ultimately getting the win over Junior, and of course he spares Piccolo's life, because Goku needs a rival, and Piccolo just fits the bill nicely, and you can already sort of tell Piccolo's not so much the bad guy he used to be. It's, you know, Goku seems to have like a sort of uncanny canny sense about that sort of things. Just like, just like with his son Gohan in the Saiyan arc. And of course, Piccolo gets his bean and pretty much runs off and he's all like, Haha, I'll finish you next time, Goku. And your mother too. And that whole thing happens and Gine actually does stick around for um, Goku's wedding to Chi-Chi. But then after that, she says her goodbyes to her son and tells her, she now uh, tells him that now she has to go to, back to Planet Vegeta and help Bardock restore the honor of the same race. She's been gone too long as it is. But Goku, he's understanding this time. He's older, more mature, and, you know, the thought of um, a whole planet of um, warriors who are stronger than him, the whole thing is just a thrill to him. Oh, wow. More strong guys for me to fight? I can't wait. The fact that Goku already knows he's a Saiyan, this is going to push Goku to more heights. He's going to be hungry for more training. And he vows to his mother, he will keep getting stronger. So, there you have it. And Gine is on her way, way back to Planet Vegeta. Remember, that's a year trip in her space pod. And, rest assure you, meanwhile on planet Vegeta, Bardock... Bardock and his little liberation movement have pretty much got the, the remaining Freezer Force on the run. 
the Frieza Fools have suddenly been ordered to retreat. So, have the Saiyans actually won? Or is there something else at play here? But either way, the Saiyans have pretty much done that. And what have they been doing since? Well, they're not getting paid to destroy planets anymore. No, they're getting paid to do the opposite. They're actually getting paid to help out planets who don't have their own security, don't have a formidable military defense. Much like the Saiyans on the on the planet... Um, damn, I've forgotten the name of the planet. You know, much like the Saiyans from Universe 6 in Dragon Ball Super, who more or less do the same thing. And in that time, the young Prince Vegeta is now the new King Vegeta. Queen Kasava um, has stepped down from being being the queen, but she still advises her son. And Vegeta still likes training with Bardock and Raditz every now and then. And as for Nappa, well, he's working on his garden. Because remember, in the Freezer Force, Nappa's job was to plant Cybermen and look after them. So it's not so much of a stretch that Nappa would be continuing his little gardening hobby and actually planting some really awesome gardens on planet Vegeta. Hey Vegeta, don't step there, don't step on the tulips! And <laughs> it's pretty comedic. And now Gine has arrived on arrived back on planet Vegeta and Yes, she does tell Bardock that she found Kakarot, but ultimately decided it was best that Goku remained there because he's got his own life there. Bardock a bit disappointed, but he ultimately understands. The, the Saiyans are progressing into a more, more of a race where everyone's got equal stature, but they're not quite there yet. And then Gine's like, Bardock, train with me. She just says that out of the blue, and that's very, very uncharacteristic for Gine, because remember, Gine, before, before going to Earth with the Kakarot, she was just the Saiyan cook, but all these training sessions with her son has sort of stirred up her hunger for battle, and, of course, she wants to show Bardock what she's learnt, and of course, Bardock is still way, way stronger than Gine, Gine is about, hmm... 12, 1300, some, something along that line, while Goku, uh, no, Bardock in his um, Super Saiyan form, he's over the 2, 3 million mark somewhere, in his Super Saiyan form. In his normal form, he's in the maybe 1 million. Still way stronger than Gine, but Gine's learned a few new tricks, and so... Bardock and Gine have a bit of a training match. Now they haven't had a training match together since back before they first fell in love, back when Gine was a part of Bardock's crew and Bardock saw whatever potential he saw in Gine and, you know, fell in love with her. And this battle, even though She's still considered a weakling compared to all the other Saiyans. She's actually holding her own against her husband who is way stronger than her. And why is that? For starters, she knows how to sense power levels where Bardock still has to use a Skelter. And that is throwing him off. Plus, she can also suppress her real power. And that is also something that's catching her husband off guard. Gine is getting a few good shots in on her husband. <laughs> and... Uh, must be true love, eh? <laughs> anyway, so Bardock, so Bardock is actually having a hard time keeping up with Gine because every time she disappears on him, he's looking around with the scouter on trying to find her. And meanwhile, Gine is able to just sort of sneak in and get more attacks in, and of course surprises him with a Kamehameha! And we get a bit of a beam struggle between the two, and the fight basically ends where Bardock has suddenly disappeared, and 
surprises her from behind and just wraps her up in a big, big, big hug from behind and says, I think that's enough of that. You really have improved. Those are some crazy moves I saw there. So remember, Gine was also helping Roshi train Krillin up Krillin and Yamcha. So she learned a few things. She learned a few of the Turtle Hermit martial arts fighting style, as well as the fighting style she learned from Kami training at the Lookout. So, which is another reason why she was able to get a lot of good moves in on Bardock. Her fighting style has changed completely. And right now, you could say Bardock has never been more attracted to his wife than what he is right now. And, well, a few months go by, Raditz, Vegeta are having their little training session with Bardock, and uh, Queen Kas Kasaba is just sort of standing with Gine, and she's noticed Gine seems a little bigger around certain areas, and Gine is just touching her belly. There is a third Saiyan child on the way. Truly, su such a romantic relationship. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, now where we last left off this story, it is time to answer the question I left in the poll for you guys to vote on. Bardock and Gine's now third Saiyan child. Boy or a girl, and per your vote, you have chosen a girl with 66%, 66% wanted a daughter, that's why 33% wanted a boy. So, girl it is, and the name suggestion that got the most likes, which I gotta admit, I really like too, I'm actually glad this one got the most likes, Barne, the combination of Bardock and Gine's name, Barne, and she is just the most precious thing, let, let, let's get a shot of that, isn't she just cute, <laughs> alright, so, the days of the Saiyans these days, things are actually pretty peaceful. In a way, the Saiyans have ultimately become what they are in Universe 6 on planet Sadala. The Universe 6 Saiyans are ultimately peacekeepers who get paid to protect planets. Just like now, the Saiyans in this What If story have become, through Bardock's leadership, getting rid of this lower class and higher class thinking that Frieza has bestowed upon him, and just redeeming the Saiyan race, and the Saiyans are pretty much able to freely travel to as many planets as they like, and meet new people, uh, try all the delicacies of course, because Saiyans love food. And as for little Barney, she's um, we're going for, to, for a bit of a time skip here, it has now been five years, and Bane, she's about the same age as Goku and Chi-Chi's kid Gohan from the original story. So we're about crossing into where Dragon Ball Z would have started originally. And Bane is just a five-year-old. Does she train and fight just like the other Saiyans? Yes, yes, of course she does. But she's like every other member of that particular Saiyan family. She's a bit different. It actually seems like when she trains, she's only just going through the motions. It seems like she's holding back. Her latent potential is actually unknown. But when she trains, she's almost at par with Raditz and Vegeta, who are still having their training sessions with Bardock. <laughs> Your little sister's catching up to us bit by bit, Raditz. Yeah, I know. Makes me proud. And Vegeta just sort of figured, <laughs> you know, Vegeta he always stands in that particular pose, looking grumpy. <laughs> and um, mostly for Barney, she's just enjoying being a kid. And she really likes spending time with Uncle Nappa. And helping him out with his garden because Nappa enjoys gardening. Whenever he wasn't 
back when Nappa was a part of the Freezer Force, whenever he wasn't conquering planets in the name of Freezer, he was in the nursery, planting all the Cybermans, looking after them, as well as the other plants that were going on in there. So gardening is a bit of a hobby for Nappa, and since now that we're in peace times with the Saiyans, he's really gone into doing his own garden. And Barney just loves to come by and help him out. Hey Barney, are you gonna help me plant these tulips today? You watch one day, these are gonna be beautiful flowers. And Barney's just happy to be part of it. And, and while all that's going on, what is Gine up to these days? Is she still like the Saiyan cook who just cooks the meals for all the Saiyans? Um, yes and no. Um, Gine does love cooking. She does love to cook. It's a hidden passion of hers. Because earlier in the story, she wasn't really much of a fighter. But since she has these abilities she picked up on Earth, she is of some use to the overall development of the Saiyans. And since then, she has pushed her power to new heights. After all these sparring sessions with her husband, she is now in charge of training up the lower class and teaching them how to sense energy and suppress their power levels. This will be handy for when they have to battle superior opponents or, um, you know, or should Freeza's men ever come, ever return. And Gine is quite enjoying this. She's enjoying being the the top dog around here at the moment. And after all the training's done, she she is happy to cook everyone a big meal for all their hard work. After all, Gine is quite the kind, caring, and compassionate Saiyan. Even more so than what the Saiyan race is starting to become now. Could say she's ahead of the curve, so to speak. Now is this the end? Is this where we're going to end this story? Heck no. Because Bardock has actually been getting some troubling signs. Remember, Bardock has the foresight from Kanasa, uh, from, that he got from the Kanassans, and they still hit him at random times. And lately he's been having troubling visions of planets being blown up and destroyed. Some of these planets look familiar. Some of the planets that the Saiyans have now been protecting or have liberated. Explosions going off everywhere, but all Bardock can really make out as to who's behind this is just a bit of a dark silhouette in the smoke of one of the rubbled cities. It looks strangely familiar. And I the other side of the universe, galaxy I should say, someone has been attacking the other planets. All the plan some of these planets that have been liberated by the Saiyans. So remember, they had the Freezer Force on the run and they haven't been heard from in years. But now suddenly, these soldiers are now attacking these um, planets that the Saiyans have liberated and they are wearing Freezer Force uniforms, or similar to, along with some new soldiers we've never seen before, and they're right now in battle with um, Bardock's crew, Tora, Fasha, Shugesh, and the other one, I, I, I can't really pronounce his name, um, is it Boris, B Boringus, uh, Boringo? I don't remember. <laughs> Oops. Anyway, so they're having an all-out fight with um, these guys, but they are on the losing side of this battle. In fact, by the end of it, Tor is the only one left. The rest have been wiped out by these guys who are similar to the Ginyu Force in a way, but it's not the Ginyu Force. And these guys actually seem to know what they're doing. But Tora is holding his own, he's actually managing to beat these guys back, but then, suddenly, he is interrupted by a sudden death beam through the chest. 
he turns around to see this being standing before him. It can't be. F Frieza? You're supposed to be dead. But the other men are just... The other men are just laughing at him. He's like, <laughs> this isn't Frieza. This guy is Frieza's brother. May I introduce Lord Cooler? <laughs> it's hard to believe that these monkeys actually defeated my brother and father. <laughs> they must have been truly pathetic. And he fires one final attack, finishing off Tora and enslaving that planet. Which planet was it? It's the same planet from the Broly Legendary Super Saiyan movie. You know, the one, um, Paragus took over and tried to convince Pr Prince Vegeta that it was a new planet Vegeta. Alright, now Bardock, of course, heard everything that was going on on this planet due to the fact that the Saiyans still use the Scouters. Now, they don't use the Scouters to detect energy. They use it solely for communication. It's the best way to stay communicated when um, these um, battalions of Saiyans are on other planets doing their protection thing. You know, easy way to call for reinforcements. Now, with um, that in mind, Bardock is horrified to that his um, greatest fears have come to life. There is, in fact, another freezer running around, causing havoc to, in the galaxy. And Kula is just taking out these planets one by one. As for Barne, uh, Barne, of course, has no knowledge of any of this. Um, she, she's just happy be, being a little sane kid and helping out Uncle Nappa in his garden while all this mayhem is going on around her. Or another planet, I should say. Now, when um, Bardock does try to get reinforcements to these other planets in order to pr better protect these other planets, but it ultimately doesn't end up working because um, they're, the current ships that the Saiyans got are just not as good as what, um, in this case, the Cooler Force are using. You know, they've got all the best stuff from you know, from the remnants of the Freezer Force. You know, they can be in new planets within minutes while... But, in some cases, some of these planets are, you know, two week journeys away, a month journeys, a year journey. You know, it's not working out. And and every time Bardock tr tries this, Cooler is just picking off all the Saiyan pods that he comes across. So their number, Saiyan numbers are beginning to dwindle really quickly. They're, they're dropping like flies. Eventually, Cooler does set his sights on planet Vegeta, and an all-out battle ensues on the planet. And it's quite obvious that, they're, that the Saiyans are on the losing side of this. They are not going to win this time. They are not going to stop this brother of Frieza. He's, he's too much ahead, no matter how much foresight Bardock has been getting into this threat. This is just one thing he just can't seem to change. That's okay. Gine has a plan. While Bardock is in his Super Saiyan form, battling with Cooler in um, Stage 5, um, he is ultimately defeated and, cool and killed by the new evil Galactic Emperor. Yeah, sorry Bardock fans, but yeah, he, he wasn't a match for fifth form Cooler. Considering he's been on Planet Vegeta most of the time, he hasn't really gotten that much. Got, gotten really, hasn't really fully mastered Super Saiyan. This is the, really the only time he's really used his Super Saiyan transformation since his battle with King Cold. So, and Cooler, he's had years to perfect his fifth form. So yeah, sorry, sorry guys, Bardock was in the losing battle this time. But, like I said, Gine has a plan. She, ha she gathers Bane, Raditz, and Vegeta all together and says, and tells Raditz, you need to take your sister and, and the king, go to Earth, find your brother Kakra, and get the Dragon Balls. Use that to, w 
Use that to undo everything Cooler has done if you have to. And Rabane, of course, she doesn't want to leave the planet. She wants to stay. She wants to stay with her family. She, you know, this is the only place she's really known. And Gine just um, gives her daughter a hug and then knocks her out. N knocks her daughter out and with that, Rats and Vegeta get on the nearest ship they could and they flee the planet before, before the planet is completely overrun and taken by the cooler force. And they manage to escape and they just can't imagine the horrible things that could be happening on their planet right now. now. And of course they do end up arriving on Earth within the year's time because it's a year's trip. Cooler, of course, no idea where they've got ran off to. And it doesn't matter, you know, it's just a few Saiyans, not hardly worth his time. He's gotten his revenge as far as he's concerned. But you never know, this might just be something that Cooler wishes he fought this something he wishes he fought and finished to the very end. AKA Goku. And do they find him? Yes pretty easily considering they can sense energy just like because Gine taught them in the previous parts how to sense how to sense energy as well as raise and lower their power levels ha well surely my brother is somewhere amongst this mess and most assured they find him relatively easy because you know Say it, energy is pretty distinctive, as well as it's pretty high. It's actually pretty much on par with their energy. And again, I already covered how Goku got so strong. Thank you, Dragon Ball Z TV special and movie villains. Now, as Raditz finally gets to meet his long-lost brother Goku... They immediately want to learn how he got so strong. Because his power level is actually slightly higher than theirs are. Has Goku hit Super Saiyan? Um, yes and no. He's, um, at that Super Saiyan level he has when he battled Lord Slug in the Lord Slug movie. You know how he had the yellow aura and the black hair but still spiking up. The hair was like slightly reddish. I believe the fans refer to this as false Super Saiyan. Well, that's where Goku is at, so he's about to hit the Super Saiyan threshold, achieving the full transformation. But he can go in and out of that, out of false Super Saiyan, no problem. And this catches Vegeta's eye. Kakarot, how did you achieve that form? I must know. How did you achieve it the first time? Because this is just something that Vegeta and Raditz could not figure out on their own, no matter how much Bardock tried to explain it. Well, I remembered I fought this, like, this guy that looked like Piccolo, and, um, I just sort of got really mad and hit it. The whole world was counting on me. And there we go. That, that is it. Rage is the key to Super Saiyan transformation. And, um, after, um, Goku being filled in on what's happened to their planet, and, of course, his parents, and, of course, um, the, the fact that Gine, Gine might not be around anymore has hit Goku pretty hard, because he got to spend a lot of time with her when, um, Gine tried to track when Gine was tracking him down and was with him throughout the whole Dragon Ball events and, and you know through the whole King Piccolo and Piccolo Jr. saga. So the fact that this that Gine might not be around has angered Goku greatly and it has angered him enough that he actually does push through and achieve the full Super Saiyan. Which, seeing that form just takes Raditz aback. <laughs> Brother, you look just like father like that! <laughs> You're the spitting image of our father. 
And Goku is, of course, he's ready to throw down. He wants to fight this cooler guy. He wants to avenge his parents, as well as, you know, cooler, a guy stronger than his father at Super Saiyan form. The whole thing is just... Well, we know Goku when it comes to fighting. <coughs> Goku, of course, suggests that they use the room in Spirit of Time to get some training done. But before heading over there, they have a bit of a talk with Bulma to find out if there's anything they can do in terms of getting their ship even faster so they can get back to Planet Vegeta quickly, you know, to try and prevent the worst from happening to the planet. Any help Bulma can do would be appreciated. And Bulma is more than happy to do, to do this, you know. Space tech. Oh yes, I will definitely play with this. And of course it's an opportunity for her to learn more about space tech. And so she can apply that to her own inventions and, you know, really make Capsule Corp a real powerhouse on Earth in terms of, you know, corporations and business and things like that. And she says, hmm, there's definitely something we can do here, but we're looking at at least a month before I can actually really do anything to make this ship of yours work any better. And hey, maybe I can build a gravity chamber so you guys can actually do more of your training, because didn't you say, um... Planet Vegeta is stronger gravity on this pla than this planet, and as well as when you did that training with King Kai, um, Goku. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I forgot about that. Well, we can certainly add a grab chamber maybe to the ship, and that of course has Vegeta intrigue too, because they need to get stronger if they're going to be cooler. And of course, from there they head to the roof to the lookout and with Kami's permission, use the room of spirit and time in order to train themselves up. Piccolo has also joined them because, well, there's still some training he could do with Gohan and maybe this Barney character while they're all out and about training. Vegeta gets the first day, taking the whole day himself. He comes out, also broken the Super Saiyan barrier. Now, while well, that day went on, Piccolo was having fun training with um, Barney and Gohan, getting a ta taste of what Barney's at, and, you know, nothing better to do on the lookout, really. Now, who's next to go in? Well, Barney's never met Goku before, so I reckon we'll have Barney and Goku go in next. And that turns out to be a pretty interesting training session. Because remember, Barney's a lot, she's a lot like G Gine, she's more like Gine, not really into fighting, and she's also a little bit on the timid side, you know, much like Kale. Much like Kale from Dragon Ball Super. But, with a bit of trading sessions and um, Goku being... Definitely different than most things, being a bit more encouraging. They're able to. She's able to progress along pretty quickly and actually getting a few good hits within Goku. And just like Gine, Goku's able to set Barney's full potential. There's something lying dormant within her, but they need to bring it out. And. Does that happen? Well, unsure. Because Goku and Barney's time pretty much comes to an end, and Raditz gets to train with his nephew Gohan during their time. And that pretty much comes and goes. Raditz breaking the Super Saiyan barrier. Um, Gohan. Yeah, not quite. Gohan hasn't quite hit the barrier yet. He's not quite strong enough to really hit that barrier. But, he's pretty much approaching to what Raditz and Vegeta were prior to their arrival on Earth. Now, yeah. during that month, which is pretty much come and gone in that time, um, Barney has gotten to meet Chi-Chi, and well, it took a bit of um, 
talking to convince Chi Chi that Gohan should go with him on planet Vegeta. What? My son go to some planet to battle aliens? On a school night? Well, that is not happening, mister. But eventually, they were able to convince her. And by convince her, I mean Goku and Gohan pretty much just flying off without a word. Yes, they're going to be in for it when they get home. Alright. So, the month has come and gone. Um, the month has come and gone, and now we've got the finished Capsule Corp spaceship. Pretty much exactly what Goku was flying in. The exact ship that, um, pretty much the exact ship Goku flew in when he goes to Namek. The Capsule ship, combined with the Saiyan technology and the Freezer Force technology that the Saiyans managed to scrub. Steel, this ship is even faster. This will get them back to Planet Vegeta within a week. So, again, they've managed to halve the journey between Vegeta, Planet Vegeta, and Earth by half once again. This isn't going to take two weeks, this is only going to take one short week. And yes, there is a gravity chamber in there. And Vegeta's just like, he's quite admiring boys. Aha! Uh -huh. You're pretty good this, aren't you, Earth Woman? Earth Woman? I'll have you know, my name is Bulma. And yes, I am a pretty good at that, aren't I? Giving Vegeta a bit of a flirt flirtatious wink. Uh, Vegeta's just sort of uh, blushing a little bit. So yeah, there's a bit of something going on with Bulma and Vegeta, just like it would have done in the anime. But Vegeta's a bit more nicer in this timeline than what he is in the original. Having to learn to respect all Saiyans as equal, and in fact all life forms as equal. It's quite the turning point for Vegeta, actually. But, with that, it's not just the Saiyans going on there, the entire Dragon Team is going as well, and Bulma is insisting on going there. You know, it's a chance to go out in space and see other worlds. You know, Bulma's not going to pass up this opportunity. Now, in that time, for that month, Piccolo has managed to gather the Dragon Balls, borrowing Bulma's radar, of course. And they have left those with Kami, who is ready to use the Dragon Balls to grant the Saiyans wish when they need it. Vegeta, of course, smart enough to leave the scouter, leave a scouter behind so they can stay in communication so Vegeta can give Kami the signal when to use the wish. What is that wish? We will find that, we will find that out later on. Now, it is blast off time the entire Dragon Team are heading off to Planet Vegeta, everyone using the Grav Chamber to train so everyone's able to get stronger. Krillin, Piccolo, Tien, Yamcha, um, Bulma, um, she's basically just trying to stay out of the room when everyone's using the grav chamber. But yeah, it's a pretty cruisy, cruisy week, and Bulma's just happy to have um, Barney to talk to, you know, another girl to talk to. It's kind of um, interesting, and um, <laughs> Bulma trying to teach Barney, you know, about hair products and things like that, which is just going over Barney's head, you know, her being a Saiyan. You, you Earth girls actually wear this stuff? <sighs> well, unfortunately, my hair will never change because I am a full Saiyan. Our, our hair, hairstyles never change. And they then arrive on what looks to be Planet Vegeta, but there's a big difference. The huge Big Getty Star has completely consumed the planet. You know, the Big Getty Star from Return of Cool Cooler, movie movie six, I believe. Yes, yeah, so we They find they arrive to find that Planet Vegeta has pretty much mostly been consumed by the Big Getty Star. So yes, the whole Big Getty Star thing has now happened, and we get Metal Cooler and his robot army, and that sort of chestnut plays out. When Goku, Barney, and all that arrive, they're pretty much immediately 
greeted by the robot army of Cooler and of course Metal Cooler himself, one of the Metal Cooler bodies. And pretty much the battle pretty much begins from there with um, most of the Dragon Team fighting off the robots and Goku and Vegeta fighting with uh, Metal Cooler. It's pretty much a very similar fashion to what goes down in the Return of Cooler movie. Raditz and Barne actually run into some into someone, someone that has really terrified them. It is Gine, but it's not Gine. It is Gine in a metal body. Metal Gine. But Barne is absolutely heartbroken seeing her mother like this, and Raditz is doesn't know what to think about this. But then, Gin, Gine, or Meta Gine, powers up to Super Saiyan. D.B. Roy, how would Cooler know about how to trigger the Super Saiyan transformation? How is this happening? This is crazy! Unsubscribe! Let me assure you that Gine going Super Saiyan right now has nothing really to do with Cooler. Well, Yes and no, really. Um, Cooler would have no idea how to activate the Super Saiyan transformation, nor would he be able to program it. No, this is all due to the fact that any part of Gine that's still in this mind-controlled, Borg-like version of Gine that still has some sense, it is the rage that she is being forced to fight her own children that has triggered this Super Saiyan transformation. And well, that is going... At the moment, that transformation is helping Cooler at the moment because she is mopping the floor with Raditz. Raditz is hesitating, it's his mother! So, yeah, you got Raditz who's hesitating and he's just doing his best just to try to keep himself alive and Barne is just absolutely terrified. She doesn't want to fight her mother at all. And, you know, and she's taken a few hits from, from her mother also, and she's terrified. She's hiding through, hiding in some of the ruins, some of the leftover cities from Planet Vegeta. You know, that leftover rubble, she's funny sort of cowering under there and crying. After all, she's still just a little girl at this point. You know, no more older than Gohan. But Gohan, along with Piccolo and Krillin, even Tien and Yamcha, they are doing their bits battling the army, and Goku and Vegeta are, of course, struggling to battle one Meta Cooler. They do eventually get to the point where they defeat that Meta Cooler, but then they're surrounded by the rest of them and are ultimately captured by the Meta Coolers. Same with everyone else with the, with the robot army. The rest of them end up captured. The only ones that are still out in the opening battling right now are Raditz Gine and Barney is still in hiding amongst the rubble. Raditz is not doing too well. He's he is he could die at any second now. He is losing energy fast battling with his mother and Raditz's heart is not in it. You know, just like Barney's heart isn't in it. And I guarantee if we had Goku battling her same thing had basically happened. Barney just sort of whimpering and cowering behind there. I'm sorry, Raditz. I wish I was stronger. I'm sorry, Mother. I wish I could free you. I could just do something. I wish I was stronger! And this is where a change happens within Barney. Does she break the Super Saiyan barrier? Actually, no. She actually skips a chapter actually goes right into Legendary Super Saiyan, or Berserker Super Saiyan. You know, what Broly had in the original Legendary Super Saiyan movie, or a better example would be um, Kale from Dragon Ball Super. Barne has transformed into Legendary Super Saiyan. Uh oh! We're in trouble now! Because as we know, when you hit that transformation, it's very very overwhelming. Super Saiyan Metagine is coming in for the final blow to finish off Raditz when suddenly Barne gets in between him and just catches Gine's hand. Give me my mother back! 
and Bane is just wailing on Gine and going on one big epic offensive on Gine and basically knocking her down to the ground and Bane still in tears and she is just ripping off these metal cybernetic placements that Kula had implanted in Gine. Ri stripping all that metal down till you get basically just regu regular Gine in a regular Saiyan armor and she's left basically knocked out while Bane is um going on a bit of a toddler tantrum <laughs> just like in, in the basic most adorable fashion she's just blasting she's just blasting at the Getty star that's pretty much engulfed the planet going you did all this you go away go away and she's just constantly firing these power key blasts which that good considering all the good guys are in there at the moment. Eventually Gine does come to and she's able to calm her little daughter down and legendary Super Saiyan transformation wears off and she's back to playing to her base form and she's just crying in her mum in her mother's arm. And Raditz of course joining with him and they're, they're having like a bit of a family group hug down there. At this point, Raditz then presses the button on his scouter and tells Kami, Do it now! Because remember, Vegeta left Kami a scouter so Kami could make the wish, could make Vegeta's wish on the Dragon Balls at the right moment. This is the right moment now that they have a fighting chance. Kami, meanwhile, on Earth releases the unleashes the eternal dragon Shenron I wish for you to undo everything that the tyrant cooler has done can you do this I don't know but I will try Whoop. and it actually does work but DB Rai you're talking about bringing almost an entire galaxy worth of planets and people. This wouldn't work, would it? Actually, it would. Ultimately, in, in terms of um, everyone that Cooler is killed, it's not really that much higher, if not the same, as what Frieza did on Planet Namek. Because remember, these planets that Cooler conquered were ones that the Saiyan race reconquered to get the Frieza Force off these planets. As for the races, that this planet belonged to, there wasn't a whole lot of them left. After what the Saiyans did to him initially when they conquered the planet in the name of Frieza, as well as what the Frieza Force did to these enslaved races, you know, completely abusing their power. Really, the int all those um, planets that they reconquered, it was basically the population of one. The only extra excess strain that this is draining on Shenron is bringing back the planets and he's just able to make that wish come true. And of course, this brings back all the Saiyans that Kula had wiped out during this whole incident, which was about 50% of them, including Bardock's crew. And the Saiyans that died during the during Kula's invasion of Planet Vegeta had been brought back, and they are all commencing one huge final assault. This time, it's Cooler caught with his pants down. And the whole trying to drain the Super Saiyans, Vegeta and Goku, of his energy goes down as per normal, with Getty Star pretty much becoming ready to self destruct. Sentient consciousness of Cooler, the one that's absorbed by the Getty Star, and a time of it trying to stop that. And this is where things really cool happen here because Goku and Vegeta aren't quite as strong as they are in the Return of Cooler movie where they best Metal Cooler and stop the Getty Star. So they're actually on the point of dying and this is where Bardock shows up. Bardock shows up with a vengeance powered up and of course the Zenkai booster being brought back by the dragon 
both father and son together unleash a combined key blast attack and take out and take out the sentient conscious of Cooler and pretty much the rest of the Getty Star. With it, all the other robots and robot armies self-destructing and all the meta cooler bodies being destroyed, the good guys are able to evacuate and get out of there before the Getty Star blows up. And um, you got Bardock flying Goku and Vegeta out at full power, so everyone's pretty much A-OK -okay there. The Saiyan race are all thankful towards the Dragon Team of what they've done, and they pretty much form into a permanent alliance with planet Vegeta. And with Bulma's work on the ship, pretty much the Saiyans can come back and forth from planet Vegeta to Earth whenever they want. Now, why would the Saiyans be doing this? Well, they've all heard about Earth's delicacies from Gine, so all the Saiyans are willing to go down there and give these delicacies a try. Since, after all, it's only a week trip to planet Earth and planet Vegeta now, why not? Saiyans could spend, have their little space vacations there and, um, eat out, you know. You know, Capsule Corp is big enough to house a whole bunch of Saiyans, you know. Capsule Corp is basically like a big Saiyan hotel to them. And, um, as for the family of Goku, um, Goku Saiyan family, they actually decide to move to Earth permanently to be a part of Goku's family. This includes Raditz, Bardock, Gine, Barney. Um, they do like to visit their home planet every once in a while because, you know, Barney does love her Uncle Nappa and helping him out with his garden. As for um, King Vegeta, our Vegeta, he would pretty much rule over the same planet, but he does like to come over to Earth, you know, get some training sessions in with Bardock and the rest of the Sun family, as well as, of course, he's taken quite a liking to Bulma.